Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. We have quite a few people online and um, uh, we have a lot to cover. So both of those things mean we should probably get started. So, well, uh, first of all, thank you for joining us for our December North Houston Space Society meeting. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of things in this meeting. Um, first off, I got some opening remarks and then we're gonna have uh, Greg Stanley give us uh, the updated space news. And then Doug is gonna go over the James Webb telescope and we'll have a Q and A and we'll have officer and board elections. And at the end, we'll have some socializing. So just a little bit about myself. I'm, um, you know, Nathan Price. I started this back in uh, 2018. I work in the software industry and I have a passion for uh, space exploration. I've been to a lot of different conferences and, um, you know, always interested in learning uh, how we're, we're getting to the stars. So I just thought I start off with this idea about choices and perspectives. So imagine, if you will, being, you know, the wide open sea. And on that wide open sea, uh, you have a boat like this. But it's not just an empty boat, of course, that would be kind of um, less interesting. It's a, it's a boat with people who are on a lifeboat. And, you know, they may have some food, but definitely not enough to, um, definitely not enough to uh, uh, feed everybody. They might have some water, but not enough water for everybody. And, um, uh, you know, so the question is, with limited food and limited water and unlimited needs and rescue is, is nowhere in sight, what do you do? And just toss it out there. If you were in the situation, what would be the things running through your mind? So uh, Tamley says, uh, you know, take an uh, inventory of, of everything that's in the boat. That sounds good and everything on people's uh, person. There's, there's no poorer person than the rich person that doesn't know what they have. <laughs> So that's a, a good first step. But what are some other things that, that would go through your mind? Well, I'm, yeah, beyond taking inventory of the food supplies, existing food supplies on the boat, I would also take an inventory of what everybody has in their pockets. There might be someone who has like a bunch of dental floss and you can use that as a start for a fishing line. And if someone else has some needles or hooks or something, you can bend a needle, you know, someone who likes knitting or something. And they've got, we, now we've got a fishing hook and we can start doing something about the food situation. I mean, take inventory of non-food uh, items and objects in the boat. Well, I definitely would like to be on a life raft with people like you, because I, I think that's probably atypical. I think most people are like, you know, we have this limited amount of food. Uh, there's too many of us. You know, a lot of them are probably like, you know, wanting to control the food. And oh, as, yeah, there's and uh, there's probably a lot of people going, we need to toss people overboard or, you know, things like that. I, I But I, I like your vision a lot better. It seems way more positive, has a lot more positive outcomes, so. Um, and, you know, kind of to that point, I, I mean, there are really unlimited resources around these people. They just have to recognize those resources. You got the fish in the sea, you have uh, birds in the air. Um, and, you know, even though they can't drink the, the ocean water, uh, it's a very simple process to take the ocean water and, and turn it into drinkable water. You just need to figure out some way to, to collect the, the vapor and condense it. Um, and what I would argue is that our lives here on earth are really no different than those people in that boat. Uh, I mean, if you look at this, this is really just a lifeboat of a different size, you know? And from this viewpoint, it doesn't look all that big. It doesn't look as big as it feels whenever we walk around our neighborhood. And uh, similarly, you know, we need to realize we have unlimited power 
I mean, if you consider the amount of the sun's energy that falls on the earth, it's about one seven hundredth billion of all the energy that it produces. Um, you know, if you took like a, a sphere that had the same, um, that had this, you bet. I don't know if I helped though. Uh, if you took a sphere that had the same diameter as the Earth's orbit and you looked at the, the uh, area of that sphere and compared it with the cross section of Earth, that ratio is about one to 700 billion, um, uh, which, you know, essentially unlimited power. Uh, if you look at, I mean, these aren't even the planets in the, the solar system. These are just, you know, the, the moons uh, and some of the bigger asteroids. Um, and, you know, there's really unlimited resources around us. If we could just, uh, you know, take inventory of what we have, see the, the resources that are out there and actually take advantage of it. And, um, you know, if we all did like what Doug was saying and look at how to make use of those resources, would we be better as a world in terms of uh, looking at each other as being a source of inspiration and ingenuity and actually the ability to turn these, um, uh, these raw materials into useful uh, resources. And so that's really the purpose of the North Houston Space Society is to kind of take that vision and excite the community about it and kind of engage and see what are the steps to make it possible. Uh, so, you know, we've of course been on tours and, you know, the National Space Society is really has a vision of using all the resources in the universe uh, for the betterment of humanity. And uh, so I encourage everybody to join us, uh, you know, sign up for an email list, come connect with other people, uh, come to our meetings, either online or here in person. Uh, and uh, talking about the meeting, we are going to record it. Uh, we'll put it online. And um, just a little bit on how to use Zoom. You can stop and start the video. Um, you can mute and unmute. Um, you can chat. Uh, and also you can raise your hands if you have questions or something to point out. Um, and with that, I think we'll move on to our next piece, which is um, uh, Greg going over the recent space news. So uh, Greg is mostly retired, but uh, I think he works more than a lot of people with office jobs. So <laughs> uh, not so much retired, uh, but uh, he has a PhD in uh, chemical engineering. Uh, he's worked on projects and uh, yeah, he's been in Biosphere too, and he's very modest. So uh, uh, anyway, with that, let me uh, switch over to his presentation. Uh, almost. And uh, here we go. I uh, hear a clicker and uh, Mike. Uh oh, I just gave everybody online some feedback. So. Okay, just testing. Do you, you think they can hear me? I can hear you. All right, let's see. Can I bring this up? I guess I have to work off of this. Okay, well, we'll talk about the space news. Um, December 11th. Start right off with uh, one of the big ones, which is an asteroid mission called DART, which stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. The double asteroid comes from the fact that it's two asteroids, um, the larger one called Didymos, and there's a smaller one, which is the one we're actually going to hit. The, the purpose of this mission is really to test planetary defenses. We always talked about it, that you know we want to divert asteroids that might be on a course with Earth. And these aren't, um, but they're close enough that we can practice on them. So this is really a first demonstration of doing this sort of thing. So the one we're aiming for is the smaller one there, 535 feet in diameter, which actually is probably pretty typical of a lot of the ones that are, are thought to possibly threaten Earth. Um, the current projections are that as far as we know, you know, maybe the next hundred years, we're probably okay, um, nothing in the way, but also it's pretty universally agreed that we probably only identified maybe 30 or 40% of all the ones out there. So there's still, even in the next hundred years, you know, you might, you might need to defend something like this. So um, the mission is called DART. Um, it just got launched on November 24th. And the idea is alter the orbit meaning to push it a little bit. The idea is normally if you do it way, way ahead of time, you don't have to push it very much. 
and of course that'll you know that'll solve the problem. So um, it'll get there. Actually, it takes about a year, September 2022. The craft itself weighs about 1,100 pounds. Um, it'll slam into it about 15,000 miles an hour. So it's kinetic energy, just basically trying to divert it. And what the hope is that it'll change the orbital period. It'd be easy to measure it because this thing, because it orbits around the larger one there, it'll be easy to measure the period. You'll be able to really know pretty well um, how it did. Now, additionally, you'd kind of like to know you know, what does it really do? You never quite know the composition of these asteroids. I mean, some of the ones we've went, gone through recently turned out to be a lot softer than we expected. You know, I mean, maybe you just blast through it. So as a follow-up mission, the European Space Agency in 2024 is going to launch a separate mission called HERA, um, which will be studying the effects. So it'll be launched in 2024. It'll get there around 2027. So it'll take a while to get all the results of this, but at least we'll know about the orbit um, effect. We'll know about that one fairly soon. Oh. Okay, so anyway, this is really the first time there will be a measurable impact on the orbit of a planetary body. I mean, you could say, yeah, every time we crash something into the moon, we alter a little bit, but nobody could measure that, it's too small. This will actually be noticeable. It may produce a meteor shower. You're gonna throw up a bunch of stuff off the surface, again, depending on what it's actually made of. Um, we may be able to see that. A few of those might even actually hit Earth's atmosphere. You know, they don't, basically they don't really know, but it's, that's, that's all uh, speculation. Now this particular mission, um, they had a couple interesting things. One of them is there's a very small follow-on, this Lichia cube, it's a small uh, a CubeSat. That's about 10, 10 CubeSat units where they're, uh, they're four inch cubes. So it's the size of four 10 inch cubes. Um, it's ejected well before we get in, in you know, distance to strike uh, Dimorphos there. It's ejected so they can take pictures. I mean, after all, once the thing is smashed into it, you won't get any more pictures. So there's a separate little mission for that. And yeah, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> all right, so that thing, um, it, it weighs about 31 pounds as opposed to the 1100 pounds you know, of the basic crap itself. Um, and that pretty much is the story on that. Other than interesting other things that are being tested out on this mission. Um, one of them is the solar cells that are on this. You can see the arrays there. They're about 60 feet wing, wing to wing there is about the size of those things. Um, they're doing the rollout solar cells. You know, they, they, they come and they all wrapped up the cylinder and then they expand on them. That's what was done on the space station recently. Uh, the most recent um, solar arrays installed there were done with that. And so now they're trying it on a, on a planetary spacecraft. So that's a little different. Um, they also tried, they're trying some new kind of solar cells where they have a lot more reflection. Um, basically they focus a lot more of the light just with some kind of reflectors on the solar cells. The whole thing is not made of that, but some of it is, so we're testing that out. And the other thing is they have a new ion engine. This is by far the most powerful, um, ion the electric propulsion engine that, that's out there right now and they're not really using that to get there it's really just for test purposes yeah you know on the way there they're gonna they're gonna run it for a while just to make sure it works um but really there, there's 12 hydrazine thrusters more typical traditional kind of thrusters that are used for actually getting most of the way there and in particular for the last minute course corrections you, you, you need something more powerful than an ion engine uh, for course correction at the end those uh, ion engines normally have to thrust the force about one one sheet of paper. Oh, this is a lot more than that. It's um was three. To, the last time they sent one of these up was for the mission to Ceres, and this is three times more powerful. I think it, it measured in like millinewtons, it's like two hundred something, as opposed to like maybe the twenty or something around a lot of the satellites. Almost, most new satellites all have ion thrusters as well. They're just a lot smaller. This just happens to be bigger. So there's still nothing compared to a traditional thruster, but the idea is they can be on continuously and then the cumulative effect could be you know, pretty dramatic and they're fast. Yeah. This one is Xenon, unlike the Krypton that they're using, for instance, on the uh, Starlink satellites. What was that quick? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, this is using Xenon. But this is the this is version C of this engine. They've had previous ones before, so it's just you know continuing. You know, and for those who don't know, an ion engine is really pretty simple. They basically just uh, you 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 ionize uh, the gas, which is xenon or whatever it's going to be, um, and you just have an electric you have a screen you electrify, and the ions go shooting toward it, 
and they, they end up going about 90,000 miles an hour and they shoot through it and that's your propulsion. So it you, you are emitting some particles, but it's nowhere near as much as you would get um, or as much as you would need with traditional thrusters. Okay, one question you might have asked, maybe not, but maybe you might have asked is how do all those pictures that they're taking of this uh, asteroid, how do they get back? And in general, you know, especially you think about it like all those really long distance probes like Voyager and that sort of thing, they're still communicating. How do they do that? Well, it's a deep space network, and that's how they get there. It's actually just three sites on Earth. Um, each of them have four or more antennas. They're 120 degrees apart in latitude, so that no matter what time of the day it is, um, there's at least one, uh, one antenna that'll be able to look out and see things. So you have 100% visibility once you're like 30,000 miles or something away from the Earth anyway. The sites are in California, um, near Madrid, and near uh, Canberra, Australia. Those are where they are. They all have at least four antennas. Each one has one large antenna, which is 70 meters, about 230 feet. That's, that's what's pictured in this, in this picture here, which has about an acre of surface area. What's interesting, though, is that really they're also doing a lot more of tying in with lots of other antennas all over the place. Um, that way, they, they get basically, you can get a lot more sensitivity um, by tying in additional ones. You can imagine, you know, you're kind of, you're adding in signals from two different, two different places. The signal you're looking for is going to get added together, and the ones you're not looking for are just kind of random and kind of cancel each other out. So the more, basically, the more antennas you have, the better off you are. Um, but even given that, you're looking for very, very small signals. And uh, what I found in, in one source was the signals, if by the time you get to the outer planets, way beyond the asteroid belt, but, but the outer planets like Neptune, the signal is 120, 20 billion times weaker than the power that runs your digital watch. You know, so you're looking at a very, very small amount of power. Somehow it has to be received. Well, amplifiers, typically all electrical equipment has a lot of noise. And so um, what they do is to reduce that, they cool the amplifiers down to a couple degrees above absolute zero. So there's, it's fairly exotic amplifiers. The actual antennas haven't changed that much in the last 15, 20 years, probably. But the sig well, the signal processing in particular is what's better now. Uh, they're much better at that. And in particular, combining the outputs from, from multiple uh, antennas. So what are they used for? In general, obviously, they're listening. But of course, they're also sending. You know, they're transmitting commands. You know, if you're going to tell the crap, it's time to, you know, time to initiate a landing sequence or whatever it's going to be. They have to do that. Um, and I should have mentioned, they are operated by the Direct Propulsion Laboratory. They've been running since 1958, and they've supported everything. The Voyager, which is just going way, way out there. Um, we also support US, Europe, Japan, and India, almost everybody but China, basically. Um, I guess in Russia. Yeah. Boy, this is really loud in here. This might be like a silly question, too yeah. obvious maybe, but I don't know. Why are the amplifiers cooled to a few degrees? Like, does that I get somehow? Uh, yeah, that's just electronic devices. I guess the, the more noise, the more the more the molecules vibrate in, in the equipment. And yeah, I don't have I don't have a really solid answer for that. What? Would that help? Yeah. No. Right. Oh, 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 for here. What do you? Yeah, no, oh, okay. Go back to your neck. Just yeah. Back to your neck. Back to your neck. Oh, okay, down there. Okay. Uh, you want you want the mic there? Yeah. If you put this in your pocket and bend right. over, you are a walking microphone. Oh, all right. Or you can do it this way because it'll go right to the fabric. There we go. Okay. All right. Well, I guess everybody can hear me better. So anyway, so your question was why? I guess I don't really have a good answer for that. It's just the nature of electronic devices. Um, I just isn't, thought that isn't it the fact that the temperature as you get up to room temperature, then there's a lot of random motion in the materials of which the, the electrical circuit is made out. It's just yeah, that's... at room temperature, there's atoms bouncing around in all of us. And that includes the electronic components. And that gets passed along through the system as noise, background noise. And you need a way to uh, discriminate between the signal that you want and the noise that you don't want. And by chilling the electronics down cold, you reduce that activity that generates noise. Yeah, I mean, at absolute zero, there's no motion. So, you know, the, the warmer it gets, the more everything vibrates. And... Reducing the kinetic energy within the system. Well, that's true. Yeah. It's all forms of energy. Conversation when there's nobody here, like it was an hour ago, 
as opposed to listening to a conversation now with all the noise coming from the adjacent room. It's probably about a thousand degrees out there right now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we just pull back. Yeah, we have we, uh, we turn the air conditioning up. Okay. Oh, any other comments there? Okay. Um, I have a question um, on the dark um, satellite. Yeah. So um, since we're planning to impact uh, asteroids, are they designed it structurally differently? Like, uh, is it meant to like, they, instead of breaking apart, maybe uh, stay together a little bit? I don't think they really care as long as it, well, the more it holds together, the better, I guess, you, you know, it doesn't go flying off. Um, if you look at the thing, it was kind of square, but that, that really is just because nobody cared about air resistance. But uh, uh, my understanding is that they likened it to shooting a uh, vending machine. So they're, they're going to shoot a vending machine at 15,000 miles per hour into the asteroid to see what happens. Yeah. Because that's about the size they're, and shape of it. Apparently. Yeah. They expect a crater maybe 20 miles or something. But again, they don't really know because they don't really know the composition of this thing. They don't really even have a good picture of it yet. So, right. you know, the pictures they have are all pretty fuzzy. Right. You can appreciate if it's made of something, the consistency of frozen cotton candy that impactor is going to go real deep yeah. whereas if it's a still more of a stony composition the impactor will only hit and maybe like sort of bounce off or leave a very small crater so it's going to be somewhere in between those two extremes most likely yeah that one recent uh, asteroid sample return project the, the, the american one that one they were surprised how soft it was they expected just barely scratch the surface and everything just kind of went right in and so, so they don't really know and they're probably all different there's no guarantee that they're all the same size and they're the same texture okay so moving on that particular um 70 meter dish that happens to be in california but they all look pretty similar except maybe they have more greenery around them Okay, uh, the next one is talking about uh, debris in orbit, uh, in this case caused by the Russians with their anti-satellite missile tests. So there's a lot of acronyms that come up, especially if you get government or military things involved. So ASAT stands for anti-satellite weapon. Uh, this is a DA ASAT. DA means direct descent, means comes from the ground. So what happened is the Russians, that, there's lots of old dead satellites up there that nobody can do anything with anyway. They had an old one um, from decades ago they weighed about two tons, so it's a pretty good-sized satellite. Um, and so they launched missiles at it. Now, the, the missiles, they probably were actually from tubes in the ground, but the, they're really just derived from what you see on the picture on the left-hand side there. Uh, they're basically something that could be done uh, from a mobile launcher. And that particular one, nobody really knows about it, what it looks like that much, but the, the, the company in Russia that builds this stuff for the government um, which was called Almo's Anto. They put out a corporate calendar in 2015 and they had that picture on it. So, <laughs> so that's where that came from. So somebody noticed this and that's how I picked up that picture. Um, <laughs> so th thank you for corporate calendars. Anyway, they, for, they come in handy. Uh, the point is, it, it can be launched from a mobile platform. It's, you know, these things aren't necessarily that huge. So the satellite that was up there was about 300 miles up, which is low Earth orbit. It is, that puts it about 20 miles or 40 miles higher than the International Space Station. So it's in that same kind of range. There's an awful lot of satellites in that area um, in that, at that altitude. Um, they don't need to have an explosive warhead. This particular missile can, because in the early days of anti-ballistic missile defense, even the Russians weren't that confident they could actually hit an incoming missile. So they figured if they put a nuclear weapon in it, they could blow it up and they'll take care of anything in the vicinity. So they could actually be armed, but that's not necessary if you're just taking out a satellite, as long as you're confident that you can hit it, which they were, and which they proved they can. Um, because this is just a variant of their anti-ballistic missiles uh, system, that same, essentially the same missile. They have several variants of them. So when they, when they destroyed the satellite, they were demonstrating one that they can destroy a satellite, but they're also demonstrating their, their anti-ballistic missile capability too. Uh, they're doing both of those things. Now, one point about these things, it only takes five or 10 minutes for it to get up there. So there's not a lot of time to react if somebody launches an attack on the satellite. So everybody in the military is saying, yeah, we've got to pretty much figure out an autonomous reaction. Whatever is going to happen has to happen almost automatically. There's not time to go and call a meeting and you know page people and wake them up and get permissions to do whatever they're going to do. It's going to happen automatically. Which is, yeah, well, that's what they say. That's all essentially the same stuff. So yeah, yeah. 
Okay, now, of course, the, down, the really bad downside of all this, besides any military issues, is debris. And it's just a constant issue. There have been several tests in the past that caused debris. Um, actually, back in 2007, 2008, the United States did one, and um, Russia did one around then, too, actually, as did India, interestingly enough. They even did them. In those tests, actually, they were all fairly, there were smaller satellites that were attacked and they were um, in lower orbits. Lower orbits are good because things decay pretty quickly. You have air friction and anything in orbit below, you know, this kind of an altitude and get down to a couple hundred miles, chances are those things will only stay in orbit in five years or so. So, you know, the problem is they're kind of self-correcting for low orbits, but the higher up you get, there's less and less, there's fewer air molecules and the fewer you have, the longer it lasts. So even just going up to 260, going up to maybe 300 miles, you're already at the point where it still will stay around for decades. So in this particular case, um, when they impacted it, it created about 1,500 pieces of, of trackable, easily trackable debris. And easily trackable is classified as about four inches or bigger in size. There's probably hundreds of thousands of pieces of smaller debris. And the reality is, I think we could track some of that too, but it's probably classified and we don't see it all. Um, one interesting thing about this test, one, it was the satellite was heavier than a typical one in the past. But two, usually you go, you, you kind of go for a head on collision. You want to have as big a velocity difference between your interceptor and the satellite itself. You know, you get, you get you know, more kinetic energy used. In this case, they actually partially matched the orbit. Um, so what they said is actually, even though they, they didn't get a head-on collision. They still had enough of an, you know, an impact that they could destroy it pretty easily. But the really bad thing about this one is that because it was essentially coming in, kind of going in the same direction, you basically, on the whole, on average, you added kinetic energy to all those particles as opposed to subtracting by the collision. And as a result of that, most of the debris went higher. You know, it got more energy, the orbits go up higher. So that means it'll be around even longer. So that was especially annoying. Um, that way and, and dangerous really in the case of a lot of a lot of satellites we're going to be threatened for years um the, actually the, the chinese test in 2007 was kind of like this there's there's still debris floating around up there that people are dodging here and there um that happens all the time but the debris from this particular collision is 190 to 680 miles from what they know so far and the lower orbits, like I said, five years, it'll probably clear itself out, uh, but it'll be decades before the other stuff clears itself out. Now, this picture on the right-hand side, this was um, kind of a simulation, but this is showing what the impact looked like. Every one of those little red dots indicated a, a major piece uh, of that spacecraft. And this was probably simulated like minutes. Yeah, I'm not sure the exact time scale here, but maybe minutes after the collision. Now, you can imagine over time, you know, they, they spread out, they actually all have, you know, velocity in three different directions. They're going to be going, you know, outward and upward and downward and left and right. So that cloud will get bigger and bigger over time. But that was even fairly quickly, you cover a pretty big area. Um, this did have a fairly immediate impact. The International Space Station, they actually kind of went through a shutdown mode where the astronauts, including the, the Russian astronauts, everybody had to get in their spacesuits, get in their crew capsules, they closed all the hatches in between all the different modules of the space station. And it turned out nothing happened. You know, they were okay, but they weren't sure. You know, there was enough risk of that. Um, um, and also apparently SpaceX had to adjust the orbits of some of their Starlink satellites as well. So, you know, already has had an impact. I think even the Chinese space station they got worried a little bit, but apparently didn't have any impact yet. All right. A little follow-up on that. There supposedly was a threat directly issued on, on Russian TV, Channel 1 TV, where they threatened to blow up. The, right after this test, they threatened to blow up 32 GPS satellites, quote, if NATO crosses our red line. And they were saying then rendering the GPS guided missiles useless. Now, if the GPS actually did go up, that would be pretty serious, um, not only for commercial stuff, but for military as well. We do rely on it a lot, although the, the military does have backup systems to some extent. Um, presumably, the red line they're talking about was when they invade the Ukraine, um, doing anything about that. But there's some reason to doubt that this was really a serious threat. And the main reason is that the GPS satellites are up a lot higher. They're up about 12,000 miles. Um, that's medium Earth orbit. 
Uh, but the, that missile that's used, um, that they launched, no one's ever seen it go even as high as this before, but even that was, um, the, th the range was thought to be maybe 1,200 miles or so. Nowhere close to the, the other one. Now, of course, that's not to say that in the future they, they won't make them you know, more powerful, but right now it probably is not that much of a threat. And it's also a little suspicious. There's one obscure website that actually started this and it got, you know, it got picked up there. Could be just fake news or more likely propaganda or just a, maybe a badly informed TV host. You know, we don't really believe everything we see on our TV either. So not much reason to believe uh, Russian TV in any case. But despite all that, the test, the fact that it existed, that, that pretty much is the message itself. It's sort of saying they can do this, that's their intention. And you can bet that on the whole, you know, they're gonna be trying to uh, expand their capabilities. And if you want people that want to take out satellites at higher altitudes, they can do it now. There are satellites up there that they can just crash together. Um, they can have ground-based lasers. A lot of this stuff is already, we talked about this in one of the previous uh, news sessions. Um, the other thing is that GPS, it is vulnerable. And there is a lot of uh, activity going on to try to make it more invulnerable, including as we talked about uh, last month, um, ha having some GPS capability off of Starlink satellites. The military has its own constellation of 120 or so satellites that are they're going to have their own GPS. So, and and every other country is doing the same thing. Uh, China already has their own, for instance. I think the Russians do too. Okay, moving on. Uh, I did yeah. have uh, one of your thoughts. Um, it seems like that destroying the satellites is one thing and pretty bad, but it seems like long term risk is a degree. Do you see a situation where we create a system that we're like protecting everybody's satellites just to prevent debris? Well, the, the, obviously, there's a lot of talk about that. You know, nobody quite knows what to do. I mean, you know, maybe Russia, I mean, Russia figures most of the satellites going up aren't theirs, and maybe they don't, they don't care that much. Um, but yeah, there is a question. What to, you know, you can't really defend every satellite, especially the small ones. I mean, you know, those really big ones that are out there in geosynchronous orbit, yeah, they're going to protect those pretty well. But, you know, every little 100 pound satellite out there, the really can't do it. You briefly mentioned Kessler Cascade. Yeah, we, I guess because we talked about that last time. But yeah, the, the general concern is the, the, the so called Kessler Cascade, where, you know, one, one, there's an explosion of some sort. You know, it sends debris everywhere that impacts others. They start crashing into each other and blowing up and creating more debris. Um, the blowing up thing is actually a pretty real issue because there's not just satellites up there. There's also a lot of, you know, of um, upper stages of rockets that didn't actually use up all their fuel. They're still up there. And every now and then they actually just explode on their own. I mean, that happens. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a definite risk. Again, the good thing is that most of this stuff is low Earth orbit where at least it'll clear itself out, you know, five, 10 years in the worst case. It's really the stuff that goes up higher that you worry about a whole lot more because that could stay, you, know, you get up like those geosynchronous ones, they're essentially up there forever. But even the medium with or earth orbits, you're probably talking about tens of thousands of years when they could remain up there, so. Correct me if I'm wrong. The, uh, the true horror of the Kessler cascade effect would be that the Earth would become surrounded by essentially a global minefield of metal components moving in every which direction at every every which speed, and we would be unable to leave the planet safely. Yeah, for quite a while. Yeah, you know, yeah, for quite a long time. Yeah, and there, that's right. There are some projects on you know cleaning up orbital debris, and we've talked about some of those in some of the previous uh, sessions too. But there aren't really a lot of good solutions for massive cleanups of small parts. You know, mostly it's oriented toward, you know, for instance, the astro uh, astro scale uh, solution is you put a special plate on every satellite, and then when it's at the end of its life, you know, it, it that something else comes along and attaches to that specialized plate. You know, okay, that that's not going to work that well. But um, you know, there are there are certainly are projects. And it is a concern, and things like this Russian test, you know, just bring it to the forefront once again. Okay, moving on to uh, NASA kind of issues. Um, they have now officially delayed the target uh, lunar landing, human lunar landing to 2025. So I don't know how you're gonna have to change the dates on your uh, your project, I guess. Yeah, you, no, you've I'm got sorry. another, you got at least another year. I, I started talking about orbiting the moon. And oh, okay. Oh, okay. So that's, yeah. Uh, 
Do, how about just doing stuff related to the moon? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and by the way, so they said 2025, but they're they're not really exactly saying it's guaranteed 2025 either. They're just basically saying it'll be 2025 or later. So they're really acknowledging it was it was maybe unreal. It was probably unrealistic to begin with, but um, now at least they're admitting it. Now there's lots of easy scapegoats here. Um, the Blue Origin lawsuit, they they particularly NASA particularly highlighted that because um, that caused you know an obvious seven months delay of sorts. Now the reality is that that didn't stop you know people working on SLS. It didn't stop people working on Starship. So the reality was a lot of work was continuing anyway. But still, it's kind of convenient <laughs> to be able to blame someone. And the Blue Origin lawsuit, it did mean that that for instance SpaceX could not talk to NASA during that period. And that had to slow things down, you know, for the human landing system, which which they're contracted to do. And of course, COVID delays, uh, there was some storm damage, uh, all those kind of things. And there's others that have already been identified about spacesuits, for instance. I mean, actually, somebody in NASA has said that, uh, well, we can't really get there because of the availability of spacesuits. There, we don't have them yet. And that's probably going to get worked. But obviously, there could be delays in uh, space launch system. There could be delays in uh, the SpaceX Starship. Which is the does, does it landing on the moon, um, and for that matter, the in-orbit refueling that's actually built into the the schedule now because that's going to be required um, for the Starship portion of this. Um, you know the Orion capsule, which is the human capsule that's in the current solution. All these things, you know, could get delayed. By the way, the Orion capsule, they just revised the cost estimates on that. It used to be 6.7 billion. It's now going to 9.3 billion. So. This thing, despite the fact that it's a, you know, essentially a remade Apollo capsule, you know, through the years it, it gets modified slightly and made a lot more expensive. Um, I'm going to have uh, an engineer from the Orion program come next month for a Q and A session. Ah. so maybe you can provide some insight. Yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll try to avoid insulting him outright, yeah. but, <laughs> but it's certainly a fair question: is what's why is it taking so long and <clears throat> costing so much? Um, some other notable things going on in some of the same announcements, they did officially commit that there will be an uncrewed landing of, of the human landing system, meaning the SpaceX or the Starship would, would make a landing. Now, actually, SpaceX had committed to that um, went back when they got this, but it was never really officially stated by NASA that that would be a part of the plan. Now it is a part of the plan. Um, but NASA also said, oh, and by the way, the Chinese may get there first anyway. So that, that was not all good news. Okay, um, other news that's NASA related, they've more or less really doubled down on the space launch system at this point. Um, they issued a contract in Northrop Grumman for uh, $3.2 billion, and they're going to produce the solid rocket booster pairs um, for six more. Now, if you do the math on that, that says that each one of those is $500 million. So each launch, People have been haggling over what's the cost of an SLS launch. Well, it's guaranteed to be at least 500 million because that's what it costs just for those boosters. Um, that's the SLS rocket on the right-hand side of the picture there. The solid boosters, um, are, they come in pairs and there's two of them there. Um, those, by the way, if you look at them, if you look back at the NASA pictures from space shuttle days, they look exactly the same. Uh, the one difference is they are longer. They, they have an extra segment. They used to have four main segments. Uh, in the, these are solid rocket boosters. Now they're five. I mean, they you know they are changing them some. They needed more thrust uh, for a longer for a longer period of time. Did they still have the parachutes? Did they recover the casing still? Or? Well, they're they're actually well, they're not recovered. They're still reusing the ones that NASA had stockpiled earlier. Um, this is this is sort of a typical NASA or maybe a typical government strategy. If you had you can't make an official decision for one reason or another, what you do is you do a lot of other stuff like this, where here you, you committed that you, you, you're you paying ahead the next 10 years just for this little part of the program, but that kind of locks you in because then you say, oh, well, we've already spent all this money, we better just keep going doing this. This is essentially committing us for the next 10 years. Um, okay, so anyway, they, um, the point is the Artemis 1 through 3 launches, which are the, the, first, the first three launches to the moon, the first one just goes around the moon with no people, the second one goes around with people, but doesn't land. Artemis three lands, and then that's all that's really been funded officially at this point. But then, you know, the plan is Artemis four through eight. Um, they're, they're they're buying the boosters for that now, even though they haven't committed to SLS for that. And they're also paying for a new 
variation on the booster. So there's some R&D in there for developing the new one, um, which would be used in, in version nine. Now, anyway, they are using up old, old cases. Those boosters, they're, they said they're like in four segments in the old boosters. They had to steal for that already because of a similar kind of a contract they had before. So they're just, you know, they had all that steel, now they're gonna finally use it. Um, one interesting thing is these boosters are, are completely disposable. Uh, back in the shovel days, a general philosophy was try to be reusable. The, the, the part where the reuse failed was that reuse actually was incredibly expensive. I mean, that was true for the shuttle with the tiles and all the other maintenance. It was kind of true for these boosters as well. They did recover them all, but well, except for the ones where they had uh, you know disasters. But the normal flights, they did recover these boosters. They dropped into the, they had parachutes and they drop in the ocean and the boat would go get them. Uh, the problem was there's about 5,000 parts on these things because of the engines, I guess, is most of it. And refurbishing them, they had to take them all apart and clean each individual part and do all kinds of work on them. Actually, the conclusion was that was probably more work than just, it, was, it probably wasn't worth it to do that. The cost was probably more than just building it and throwing it away. So they used them 10, 10 times each booster. Hmm. What someone told me who was associated with the program. I guess, yeah, I guess. And they retired. Yeah. So it's interesting is so that they did make reuse work, but it was incredibly expensive because it took a lot of work. Um, wow. <laughs> I can't hear you. There's too much singing going on. I said, if you can hear me, then I have a question. Yeah. So for Artemis 4 to 8, if they're getting the boosters for those missions now, and it can be reused like 10 times, like Doug said. Well, but that was the old, that was the one that was shuttle based. These, these boosters are not reusable. Oh, they're not reusable. These are not going to be reusable at all. So basically, you're just getting the, the launches, and that's it. Yeah. So they just. They just they just drop into the ocean and they sink, I guess. Wow. Or maybe somebody recovers into scrap metal. I don't, you know, I don't know, but it's not part of the plan anyway. Oh boy. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, so in a way, this kind of locks in the technology and it kind of guarantees funding for the vendors. Um, this happens to be north of Grumman right now. But th th that's only because they inherited the program from Orbital ATK, which you know inherited the program from Fiocall, which actually made the you know the original versions of these boosters. Okay, um, moving on, um, space stations. Now we talked about some of this last time, but now they've made some official awards. Um, NASA has NASA is a uh, <laughs> they're spending four hundred sixteen million dollars. Um, to three groups. Now, a lot more groups had applied for this funding. I think maybe 10 or more had applied, or maybe a dozen, but it, three of them are now funded. Um, <laughs> so, NASA set up a program which sounds like a pretty good one a commercial low Earth orbit destinations. It's kind of, kind of like the way they did the commercial crew program and so on. You know, they issue a um, you know, request for service you know and then get that get people to bid on it so they're funding it out to 2025 three basic teams there's nanorax as heads of one team and they're working at voyager space which really is just the parent company of nanorax anyway but also with lockheed martin they have this project called Starhab, and that's the one on the left hand side of this and we talked about that last time that is mostly and mostly an inflatable uh thing so the right hand side of it in particular is an inflatable part and there were some questions about this. And the big thing is these things are gonna be a whole lot less expensive than the original space station. And obviously just to get it up there, for instance, this one on the left, they're claiming they can get that up in one launch. This is not you know, a giant thing like the space station where it takes many, many launches. This is one. Now, all these things are, for the most part, are gonna be modular. So you get something up and um, you know, if you wanna expand it, you launch another module. So they go up module by module. The second team is the Blue Origin team. And again, we talked about that one. Blue Origin heads it up and that works with Boeing, Red Wire, Sierra Space and others. Sierra Space, they have, they also have an inflatable module. We pointed it out last time. That's like this particular one and sort of the center of this uh, center picture here. Those are the inflatable parts. And again, the, the, their, their initial program would not put up a station that looks like that picture right away. That, that would be after quite a few modules were up. But the initial modules you know, would be self-sufficient. One that's new 
that it was not mentioned before and really hadn't been revealed until now is Northrop Grumman is now in the picture and they got 125 million for that. They're teamed up with Dynetics um, and maybe some others. And essentially what they're doing is they're just taking, well, they're taking their Lunar Gateway and their Cygnus uh, work. Cygnus was the, the cargo uh, ship that goes to the um, space station now. Lunar Gateway um, you know, was their, sort of their space station around the moon. So they're really reusing that work. So they're, they're in the mix. So now there's the three of those. Now, one thing we talked about before, there was 140 million already funding Axiom Space, and they're going to have, as part of that funding, they're guaranteed to put in at least one module in the space station, but it's detachable. So that when the space station goes away, they can be off on their own. Now, the one module is not enough for, for being self-sufficient, but part of that 140 million goes to putting up a total of about four. And that whole section would actually be detachable. And so they could, you know, you can do it, they could do whatever they're going to do with the space station and the Axiom station could stand on its own. Now, th this is just funding for R&D essentially. Um, but then, except for, as I was mentioning, Axiom space, that's actually to put something up there. So they're way, and you can say they're way ahead of the others on that. <laughs> Just for building the module, does it include the cost of launching it, or is that separate? No. Well, who's which? Oh no, that's including the whole. That's the whole thing launching it. Everything. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's including launching the first one. I don't think it includes launching the others, but they have to at least prove they can do one. But as part of it, they're planning on putting up more than that. Because I, I can imagine it's like 90 million just for uh, Falcon 9, so that only needs 50 million to build the model. Mm. True. Okay. Well, they might be assuming Starship in there. I don't know. I've got to come closer. I can't hear you. <laughs> well, the, yeah, the Big, Bigelow, the yeah, Bigelow Aerospace had created this inflatable launch. So they proved that you can do it. There is one actually on the space station right now. So, no, that was called Bigelow Aerospace. And they, they went, well, they didn't actually go bankrupt, but they just fired all the people. So there's it, it kind of sitting there. They may yet come back. You know, it's one of those things where they could reactivate that if they get funding. So you never know. They do have a design for that B three thirty, I think. They have a design for what? No, I haven't. Oh, the B three thirty, the bigger module, like the one that's on ISS. Bigger those is the B module, right? The smaller, like the yeah astronauts' closet or whatever. Like it's a small. Yeah, it's up there. Yeah. But like B three thirty, like the one that's like too small, like its own station. The private space station almost. Um, yeah, that's not up, I think, right? Or so you're saying they have a, they already have a design for a bigger one. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and, and, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, the question was it goes back to Bigelow Aerospace, and she's saying that they're you know they have the one that's up there already. It was kind of a small scale demo. They have plans for a bigger one, and they were already in place. So yeah, one might think they could just go out and try to raise money. Um, you know, and also compete in this area. Because they've actually, they are the only ones, yeah, you can say that actually put up something that actually works, um, that's inflatable. Anyway, so all this goes out to about 2025, and then there'll be another round of funding that would actually fund the building of um, whichever ones get selected. And then there's off to the, the fun stuff here. Um, spin launch, uh, probably some of you have heard about this. Um, I mean, it, it's one of those things where is this a crazy idea that might work or is it just crazy? And yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it makes sense in a lot of ways. You, you know, what, what it is is, you know, you think about why does it cost so much to launch stuff to space? Well, I mean, well, one is building custom rockets every time, but once you get past that, another thing is just that it takes a lot of fuel. And the reason it takes a lot of fuel is that when you first get started, most of the fuel you're using is just lifting the rest of the fuel, and so. You have a huge rocket, and by the time you actually expend the fuel, there's not much left. I mean, most of the weight of the rocket is in the fuel itself, and so all the all that you're all that you're all that thrust is really just going to move most of the fuel. So you want to get past that. Well, how do you do? How do you get around that? Well, people are talking about railgun kind of things here, where you have an electromagnetic launcher where you shoot it up. That's and that's really more or less the same the same school of thought that this has, except that this one is mechanical. It's not even electrical. Um, what you have is a centrifuge and you just spin basically really, really fast and you let it go in the right direction. And that's what that would be. So here they have a picture. First, we'll talk about the envisioned one. So 
This one on the upper left-hand side here, that's not built yet. That's just the envision one, but they're, they're, they're searching for a site right now. But I like this one because it shows you opened up. If you look inside, this is with the top removed. So this is before it's completed. There's just a big rotor in there. And the thing you're gonna launch is at the top of that rotor in this picture. You know, that's gonna be spinning around. Then you have a counterweight, you know, so that it's evenly, evenly balanced and on a little shorter arm there at the bottom. So anyway, the thing spins and spins and spins, it goes faster and then it gets released and it goes shooting out that chute there. And that's pretty much the basic idea. I mean, it sounds simple. Um, it is simple in that regard. Yeah. Brad, there's a survived this. I'm sorry. <laughs> what? Is there any sense of humor to survive this process or is this no. cargo only? No, this, yeah. Is, this is, yeah, we have to get to this. This is definitely cargo only. You know, people are not going to go on this. You, 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 it's in the next slide, but you're talking like 10,000 G kind of forces. Um, <laughs> it's not even just people. I mean, there's nothing organic would survive that. It's, uh, it's strictly for, for cargo. <laughs> But the basic idea is you're not even actually getting all the way to orbit. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it, the limits are based on how fast you can spin it um, without destroying it, um, that kind of stuff. Greg, did well, you see they, my well, message? They claim you can get stuff to orbit almost. But, so what they do is they still have a rocket as a second stage. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know I don't know what they've said. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, it's what their plans are. Well, actually, it's on the slide here. Their plans for the, at least their their first version is they can get 200 kilograms, which is 440 pounds, up to low Earth orbit. And that's not all just with the, with this device though. This device acts as the first stage. It, it itself doesn't get you to orbital velocity. So you still have a, you have a small rocket inside. I'll get to that in the next slide. So it releases, it replaces the first stage. So you launch the thing, you know, you send the thing shooting out and that should save maybe 75% of the fuel. So that's where the big cost savings come in. Um, because as I said, most of the fuel that's in the rocket is mostly going to accelerate the other fuel that's still left. Um, they're, they're targeting 200 kilograms. Their eventual goal is to handle maybe five launches a day. So they're targeting small satellites, but that's a lot of the market right now. Um, small satellites, um, not people. You know, one 440 pounds doesn't leave you a lot of room for life support and that kind of stuff anyway. Um, they've raised money to do this, and then they actually did build something. And that's this uh, on the lower left-hand side of this picture, the uh, suborbital test launcher. And this is actually built, it's in uh, Spaceport in America, which is in New Mexico. It's 165 feet high. It's about a third the scale of their final device, which would look like the one above it. And it's going to shoot. It actually they did their first test, which is why we're, we're talking about this today. They, they did a test. Oh, yeah, this has been well, yeah. That's that's why we're talking about it today, is because they did actually run a test. And let's talk about that. Um, first of all, the, a little more details on this. So the rocket itself, that's it there. I think it's like. 10 feet or something, it's not terribly big. Um, but this is the thing that gets launched out of the, cent the centrifuge, uh, which by the way is kept in a vacuum so that they don't have a lot of air resistance. Um, you know, they can spin a whole lot faster. Um, and what, what's inside that rocket, basically once it's launched, then the outer, it's almost like fairings here, those come off and that reveals the actual um, thing, which has a, you know, a stage one and a stage two rocket all within that 10 feet or so, and then the payload, the 200 kilogram payload up there. And so that's what that looks like. Now, remember we said this thing is kept in a vacuum. That's why they can spin it fast and um, you not have a lot of uh, air friction and that sort of thing. So what they do, they literally have like a sheet of plastic here at the top of the thing. And this rocket burst just shoots through it. Oh, okay. That's, that's how they keep the vacuum. They said this thing is, is actually, one, even already, is one of the larger vacuum chambers that exists. Um, they need a really fast door to open up. Yeah, <laughs> it's a really fast door. It's called blasting through it, literally. And this is, a, this is supposed to be a picture from their test. This is what it looked like blasting through. So 
<laughs> their first suborbital test, they said it was successful. I'm not sure it was tracked by anybody, so you have to probably take their word for it. But they had they had video of it, and they looked pretty convincing. Um, yeah. And I'm saying this the way I am because there were a lot of people who were convinced this was an outright scam, just basically a, a way to collect money from investors. And I'm not sure we know 100% if that's true or not, but um, at least at least they have built something and, and it appears they have demoed it. Um, so what they did was they've only run at 20% power so far. Now you'd think by now they would have run some more tests at higher speed, but they haven't yet. And that also what they launched was didn't contain the rocket engine. It was really just a, you know, just a shell of this, just a shell. But they said the projectile got up into tens of thousands of feet. So it's got a long ways to go before it gets uh, closer to orbiting. But they're planning on another 30 tests or so in the next six to eight months. I mean, tests are pretty easy for them. You know, they push the button to turn it on. They push the button to say, let it go. Um, you know, and then you see what happens. Now, there are a lot of challenges for this. Um, one is high vibration. Um, the thing is spinning. I think the RPM isn't as high as you'd think, but still, it's pretty high. The G-force is the killer, literally, for people anyway, at 10,000 G. But there's other problems, too. You know, most rockets, when they take off, you know, they're starting off really, really slowly. And by the time they're going fast and getting significant air friction, they're up way, way high in the atmosphere where there isn't much air. That's the exact opposite here. Here, you're going 5,000 miles an hour when, you, when you're, you're coming off the top. And... All of a sudden, you're going from 5,000 miles. All of a sudden, you're hitting this wall of air that wasn't there a second ago. And you know, predicting the aerodynamics of that is probably not an easy problem. Um, you're going to get high temperatures. You're going to get shock waves. So certainly, a lot of concern on how that'll work. And that's why they had to do this kind of testing. So at least they um, they demonstrated that lower power it could work. Um, another thing to think about is. When that vacuum breaks, you're going to get a sudden inrush of air. You know, that's, that's, that's got to slow you down a little bit. Um, and the other thing is, what happens once you, release, once you release the load? You have this thing spinning, you know, at, at however many RPM that was. You just released one end of it. All of a sudden, you just have one other, you have the, the counterweight still spinning. I didn't really understand how they solved that problem. They said they have. You, you shoot it out too. Second, you have a second mass on that arm that's much closer to the center. And as, as soon as it swoops around and releases the rocket, boom, now you've got that unbalanced arm. You let that second mass go run out at the end of the arm, and it takes the place of the first mass of the loose rocket. And yeah, maybe it, they didn't. It's the, it's the moment arm. Yeah, it wasn't clear. It wasn't clear how they do it. But, but even that's not, I mean, if you got it spinning that fast, by the time it hits the outer edge of that rotor, it's got to be, it's got to be going pretty fast too. You know, that would be, you know, it's, it, it's, a, yeah, it's a technical challenge as well. <laughs> about the uh, dense air, what about building it on the top of a very tall mountain? Yeah, yeah that, it, you have to wonder about that. It, it's interesting that they, they picked the... Well, see, they picked they picked up. You can see the ocean in the background there. They're envisioning launching from the coast for the usual reasons for rockets, and that you, you know anything that falls down is not going to fall on a population. Um, but that's obvious. In fact, well, taking that a step further, um, places like the moon, that'd be really great because one, you know, it's already a vacuum, and um, you can just you know run it, and there's low gravity as well. So it, you could definitely get to orbit with this. Now, in the past, when people were talking about building O'Neill cylinders and so on, they always said, well, okay, let's just launch a bunch of stuff electromagnetically off, of, you know, off a rail a rail gun kind of a thing on the moon. This would be an alternative technology for doing that. It's a lot better, easier to uh, transport. Yeah. Than yeah. The idea that you can do this on the moon is really cool because obviously there's a lot of extreme air friction. I'm thinking because there are a lot of, you know, like pyroclastic deposits, like iron stuff in the near the volcano or like the skylights and stuff in the latitudes. What if could we use ISRU to like build one of these? Okay, so the question was. Can you do ISRU in, in situ research utilization? Can you build one of these things on the moon itself? Because there's a lot of iron in here. Yeah. I would think so. I mean, it probably does take some pretty precision machining at some point, just because you're talking about spinning heavy masses at high speed. You know, you got to be sure the balancing is really good. But 
you know, yeah, one would, one would think. Uh, they're not they're not there yet. I mean, they'll be happy to get this thing working on Earth right now. Yeah. This can be mega tools of like power it takes to get it spinning. Did they what? This how many mega tools it would take. Somewhere. Um, I, I probably saw that in passing. I, I don't have I don't have a number, but it doesn't. You know, it, it it spins up slowly. It takes at least a couple minutes. I mean, it's not. It doesn't go instantly to full speed. It takes a while. So, you know. I wonder how many launches it can take before, like, it takes. I don't know how, how it works, but like before it turns on, two hundred and then it goes. Well, the big. The big, well, the biggest thing is just applying more and more power to see how that works out. Um, the second thing is they have to actually get their second or third stage rockets built. Now, one thing, because of the high G-forces and high vibration, they've opted for really simple designs on the rocket. So for instance, that upper stage is really just a pressure fed thing. Um, there's no fancy pumps or anything like that for pumping fuel. I mean, it's just high pressure fuel, shoot it down to, you know, to be uh, combusted. And anyway, so those are the challenges they have. They don't seem as worried about that. I mean, in a sense, the challenge is, can you make this work? And then, of course, the other challenge is testing. And now they say they've actually verified that there's a lot of equipment that couldn't withstand the vibration and g-forces of this. You know, electronics, uh, for the most part, could actually be okay. So I'm going to say, basically, five launches a day, spread over like a 10-hour period, I assume, a long day. That would be a two-hour, a two-hour turnaround time to bring a new rocket in, hook it up to the, the spinner arm, put a new uh, membrane on their exit tunnel, and then spend most of the rest of the time after that, the next yeah. hour, pumping the air out of that chamber. Yeah, uh, that, and that, that, that in fact may be the, the limiting factor. Yeah, well, that, re that and retrieving retrieving these, uh, you know, these, these yeah. rocket shells. Yeah, the concept is practical, but also is practical. Yeah. Not just the yeah. Practical tomorrow, yeah. Yeah. What would be cool mechanism to replace the plastic sheets? I feel like, like, looks like it's riveted from the photograph. I don't know anything about this, but if they have like the roll of the material and then <laughs> stick it, like somehow there's an arm clips onto it. Oh, just yeah, pull it, like a roll of saran wrap. You just yeah, pull it out. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, the comment was, yeah, just just have a roll of this material. And you know, who knows what they're planning on? This is this, after all, is a prototype. But yeah, the idea is, yeah, you just have a big roll of this stuff, and you know, once you blast through, you quickly roll, pull out the the saran wrap equivalent and tie it down somehow. So anyway, this is a, a completely different approach to getting into space. I mean. You know, the, the wilder ideas out there that may eventually really work and be really, really cheap are things like this, some kind of electric railgun kind of a thing, space elevators, you know, the, those kind of things, when they finally happen, will probably change the economics, uh, you know, even more favorably. But we just have to get past these initial stages. So when was that first subword test? It was just in the last month here. Oh. So... Okay, um, next topic up, coming up, launching, I think December 22nd is the current schedule, is the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Now, Doug is gonna talk about that in more depth. I'm just gonna give a, a few quick comments about this thing because it is coming up and it's a big project. This one started back in 1996, so it's kind of been around for a while. The original launch was scheduled to be 2007. They didn't make that. <laughs> <laughs> and they still haven't made it, but it's really, really close now. Uh, we're almost there, real soon now, as we say. So um, it would go up um, on an Ariane 5, that's the European Space Agency French rocket, basically, from French Guiana, which is a, one of the big launch sites, and a lot of rockets go up from there. Um, where it will go is around the um, Lagrange Point L2 for the Sun Earth system. And there's a diagram there on the left hand side explaining what that means. So there, there are several spaces, places that are pretty useful for, for orbiting. Um, think of an axis going from the sun through the earth as, as is shown in that arrow on the left hand side there. The L1 point is in between the sun and the earth. And that's where you put things like solar observatories because 
the point of that of that is that for very minimal amount of, uh, of fuel expenditure, it's it's almost stable, where it goes the same speed as Earth and it maintains the same angular velocity, basically the same orbital period. And so as a result, it's always in the same relative position to Earth. So for instance, we can communicate, like in the solar observatory case, we can communicate with that always because it's always just being between us and the sun. This is sort of the opposite situation. You actually want to shield this telescope from the sun. Um, so what you do is you put it out there so that it always has the Earth blocking most of the sunlight. You want, you want to see some of the sunlight because you need to get power. But you don't want a whole lot of light. After all, you're running a telescope and you're trying to see things without a lot of light around it. So you want it out there. So L2, that point, again, it matches the period of the Earth, the orbital period of the Earth, but it's further outside of that. And so that's where they're going to have it. But you don't want to have it right there. The problem is that um, the moon would, you know, the, the Earth, the sun, the moon, and the Earth, all, and the sun, they're all in one plane. And that says that as the moon orbits the Earth, periodically it would block a signal path between Earth and the observatory. So instead, what you do is an orbit around L2, and that's called a halo orbit. And that terminology actually came from um, thinking about it around the moon. Um, if you were standing on Earth looking at the moon and you were doing a, a, a halo orbit around it, it would look like a halo around the moon, literally, if you could track, if, if there was a, you know, like a giant fireworks or something that, uh, you know, left the trail behind it. That's where that terminology came from. But anyway, um, they are talking about, well, they are planning on going out to the uh, halo orbit around the L2 point. And so the Earth blocks the sunlight right at the point, but you go around that, that way you get some sunlight for solar power and you get, um, you know, always have a signal path for transmitting the images. And then Doug will talk about this in more detail. Okay, now we're at that point where we ask, how many launches does everybody think we've had since the last meeting, which was November 6th? And I'll, I'll say, um, I didn't, I cheated a little bit. I included one launch from China on November 4th in this count. I had to, because it just wasn't, it wasn't um, publicly, it wasn't noticed yet back at the time of the last one. So, so it's one higher than the official period starting on the 6th. And as a reminder, this includes failed launches as long as they got off the launch pad. Um, it only includes launches attempting to go into orbit or beyond. So this does not count, you know, the Blue Origin stuff where we just, you know, send people up and down for 10 minutes. That, that's not really significant enough to be in this count. Um, the Russian anti-satellite weapon test doesn't count either because those things, they actually get up to orbital altitude. They have to if they're going to hit something in orbit, but they couldn't, they're not going fast enough to maintain an orbit. So they, they will never count, um, you know, in these kind of things either. Um, so. How many think there's been more than 12, say, launches in the last month? OK, how many think less than 20? Less than 20, sure. Nope, you're all wrong. It turns out there were 21. Yeah, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a busy month. Nope. Where, where, where do I need to point this? It's not. Uh, Oh, oh, it's because oh, it's because of the polling here. Okay, oh, yeah. Okay. okay, it got held up, I guess. All right. So, in terms of people's responses, oh, they were guessing like nine. A lot of people guessed twelve. Twelve was almost always right in previous counts. <laughs> but you know, part of that was there were a lot of things that were kind of gummed up because of uh, COVID and everything. And now that we're finally working our way through a lot of that, there's really a lot. There's been a lot of a lot of launches. Let me clear this out of here. So it's a certain amount of catch-up work going on here. Okay, maybe now I can. Uh... You might have to click on the, the screen. Also. And we have in that Zoom got focus. Uh, now try. I just. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. There we go. Okay. So. Uh, I'm obviously not going to go through all these. I'll just highlight a couple of things. Um, November 10th, there was a third launch of SpaceX, uh, you know, their, their crew launch to the ISS. Um, on the 13th, there was a new batch of Starlink internet satellites, but this is different because these are at a different altitude. Or they pretty much said they've completed one orbital shell where everything, and that was like um, 320 miles up here. No, it was 340 miles up, a little bit, a little bit higher than this. 
So they completed that one. They're starting a second shell, meaning distance from the Earth. Um, so it's kind of significant in that sense. Um, Astra finally managed to get a test flight going into orbit. They're one of these, you know, these new space companies coming along. They're the ones that are kind of interesting. What? Where did they launch out? Kodiak, Alaska. Kodiak. <laughs> that, they can launch from anywhere. They basically drive up in a truck. Um, they can prepare a launch launch site in a day or so, and they, they just uh, they can do it. But obviously, they're they're doing the smaller satellites, but they've been kind of an interesting one because they're they they have some interesting technologies. I think they were the one that last time I was pointing out that they were the ones that they started to go up, but one of the engines failed and it, it, it just kind of drifted sideways for a while. Yeah. And then finally enough fuel burned up that the thing got lighter and the same amount of thrust was still there. So it finally started going up, but it was, you know, but then it couldn't make orbit at that point. They changed their design between then and now. They added extra, basically they added a, a length to it. They put more fuel in the thing. Now it has enough fuel it could uh, go, well, the, the engines all work for one thing. And the other thing yeah. is it has more fuel. So they made, they made a change because of that. So that was kind of interesting. There's more and more of these small companies coming in doing the small launches because there's perceived to be a huge market for small satellites. And you know that, there is one. It's really incredible that they could identify the problem, identify a fix, and then implement yeah. the fix that quickly. That, that is I amazing. Mean, this is like phenomenally fast. Yeah. I mean, this, this is like NASA in the early 1960s. That's how yeah. fast they were going then. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about DART um, already. Um, the Russians put a new module up there. Now that's kind of interesting. They had just recently, earlier in the, you know, a couple of meetings ago, they just put up the, the NACA science module, which was a big one. And that was an old one that had been sitting around. Just, there wasn't enough lift capacity to get up there. They finally put that in there <clears throat> and they, had, they did this one. Now they've really said, this will be it. They're not doing any more. All this was really was basically a docking module. It has essentially it's just a shell with six ports on it so that you can hook things up to it, like cargo craft and that sort of thing. When they were, what? Yes. Yeah. So it was interesting for a while though, the Russians were talking about not even launching the NACA module and not launching this one, but taking those two and making their own space station out of it. They changed their mind on that partially because they decided that the, that NACA module had been sitting around so long they didn't trust it anymore. So they thought it was fine to send to the space station, but they didn't want it in their own space station. And once they did that, they figured, well, okay, they might as well send this thing up and just be done with it. So <clears throat> they've officially said that's it. They're not sending anything more up there. Um, but the plans in the in the possible there was always a possibility that because it has six ports, you know, they could easily have hooked in more you know, more modules. Um, the other stuff is all kind of routine communication satellites and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> page two of the list, you don't get page two very often. Page two, uh, more of the same. Of course, the one notable one would be the uh, Japanese tourist, the 12 day mission to the International Space Station that went up on a, a Russian uh, Soyuz. And this is the same guy that's going, um, going to go do the Dear Moon thing, you know, going uh, on the SpaceX craft around the moon when that's when that's available. It's the same guy. He paid for that and he took a, a like a, a movie guy, you know, somebody with him to, to make movies out of the thing. Um, the other thing I underlined the fact that there's two NASA missions <clears throat> in this in this current batch. The the dark one, I'm sorry. And this other one here, uh, an X-ray astronomy satellite. These are going up on, on, on Falcon 9s. It is now, it used to be that NASA really didn't send anything interplanetary or anything beyond Earth orbit um, on Starship, or no, sorry, on, on, on Falcon 9 from SpaceX. Now it's kind of come become the default. So there's been a noticeable change in that. And these are that's the, that was a dirt was one of the first. So you're saying and, NASA is now utilizing. <clears throat> Yeah. yeah, it's just so much cheaper. It's just so much cheaper that they can't resist. Yeah, so, deep, deep missions, deep space missions. yeah. Okay. Discussion, questions? So, uh, yes. <clears throat> the, uh, any news about the December 7th Atlas V uh, technology demonstration satellite? I haven't heard much. I mean, other than the fact that uh, you know, it launched. Don't know much about it. It is it was it the uh, the little midget uh, space shuttle, uh, the X thirty seven. Oh, I hadn't. Heard, I didn't think. No, I thought these were all just routine 
You can do satellite kind of demos. Okay. There, there were something special about them that I didn't actually have time to dig into it. Okay. Yeah, so it's okay, there's black sky keeps getting mentioned there. The, yeah, it's just another is another one of these people putting up constellations. These are Earth observation satellites. It's amazing how many there are. Um, I mean, right now they have 12 satellites. Typically they're selling it, they're selling intelligence to you know companies or, or governments. You know, typically it's just photos. <clears throat> or it could be other, you know, other other spectrum, but <clears throat> they're doing that. There's another company called Planet that you've probably never heard of. They have a couple hundred of these satellites up there really? doing the same thing. Yeah. There's all these businesses going on right now that almost nobody knows about. They literally have hundreds of, they have satellite constellations that are a couple hundred. You know, that's, this one is nowhere near that big. <clears throat> but it, and then there's more coming. Well, there's, a, I guess there's a market. I guess the CIA got tired of paying. Uh, it's, mostly, it's mostly commercial. But the other thing driving it now is also everybody's worried about climate stuff. So they're monitoring like deforestation in, in, in Brazil and you know, things like that. And that's best done by taking pictures of satellites. And there's such a market for this. Well, I think it still does open the possibility that um, the, the CIA and the economics got off all that well with some of the military. And so having to route their uh, intelligence requests through, say, the Air Force to go task this satellite to look at this location may be something that, for whatever reason, they didn't want to share with the Air Force. And now this gives them a second route, yeah. an alternative route to look at things that are of interest to the CIA, but which they don't really want to share yeah. with anyone else at this time. Yeah. So the comment is that agencies like the CIA don't want to share what they're doing. So they go to these third parties. That's true even more so for foreign governments. Yeah. I mean, if you're Mexico or Canada or Israel or something. Or Sierra Leone, <clears throat> or Ecuador, yeah. Ecuador being worried about you know possible invasion from Bolivia. I mean, <laughs> it could happen. Sure, lots of things could happen. Yeah, but actually, like yeah, Middle Eastern countries, you know, they don't have much going on there other than UAE, which has a major space program. But you know, they want intelligence; they can buy it now for American companies. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> if you're Iran, you probably indirectly, you know, you pay somebody else to do it for you, but you probably get it from American companies. They're not all American, but a lot of them are. I think we're right out of time. Better switch oh, over. To yeah. The, uh, okay. So the just question. Doug, I have a question. He's uh, been in NSS forever. Um, I don't even know how many years that's been, but forever is a long time. Um, but he's always been interested in space technology. He's an expert in oil field equipment, uh, surface and subsea. He's worked for a variety of companies in that area. I don't think he necessarily changed jobs all those times. I think the company That's changed correct. underneath him. But uh, <laughs> uh, he, he ultimately, he's a BS uh, in mechanical engineering from Rensselaer and is a licensed professional engineer. And he's going to talk about the James Webb telescope. Awesome. I'll switch okay. this. I'll let you all do the mic. Just anywhere. Okay. So this, this can just go around doing that. Okay. You stick it in jeans. It's long enough cord. You can stick it in jeans pocket. Okay. Oh, no, He's actually struck by yeah. Uh, I'm not sure where to put it. So you can put it on your waistband. Okay. Or you can put it in your pocket. It'll it'll come through. It'll come through the shirt. Okay. Yeah, that'll come through. All right. So this just goes around your neck, this one. Okay. And then this this surface right here yes. is twisted because this okay. is the surface that collects your voice. Right. So you can, uh, if you can, if you can hear your self transmitting, just reposition. It's, it's really okay. convenient. I can hear. Okay. It sounds good to me. Good. Sound good? All right. Yep. And then that's all right. All right. And you can show the reader right here. We can turn this however you want. Okay. Uh, thank you. I hope you're all are real fired up about this. Yeah. This is the James Webb Space Telescope. It's finally here. The launch date is like 11 days away. This is a, a long, long time in, in the works. Uh, this is an overall view of the uh, observatory. Uh, this is the cold side, mostly view. Uh, you see the big optical mirror, and then there's the secondary mirror way out at the end, and then it bounces back. 
And then behind this back plane are the uh, scientific instruments. And then you see the big silvery sunscreen sun shield there. And then on the bottom side of the craft in this view, you can just make out some additional hardware. And that is all the uh, uh, communications gear, the downlink back to earth. And uh, you can see that those bottommost sheets are sort of pink. And that is basically because they have a special treatment to reflect sunlight. The sun is down in this picture. And uh, so the, the craft is divided into a hot side and a cold side. And they want all the optics and all the inter instruments, scientific instruments over there on the cold side. And we'll get into that in just a moment. So, so uh, the Jack Webb Space Telescope will be launched from uh, French Guiana, as Greg mentioned um, a few moments ago. And on uh, December 22nd, uh, it uh, will take 29, let's see here. It's been in development for 25 years, since 1996. There were, uh, it was supposed to launch in 2007. The, uh, there was a whole lot of technology development that had to take place. And uh, we'll touch on some of that as we go along here. But the uh, observatory, uh, the, the observatory will launch out of uh, Guiana and it will be folded up in the, inside the rocket fairing at the top of the Ariane 5 rocket. Then it will take off at about a half hour, or yeah, about a half hour after launch, the uh, observatory will be on, on its way to its final destination. It will take 29 days to travel from low Earth orbit to its destination, the Sun Earth L2 Lagrange point. At these points, wait a minute. Okay, yeah. At these points, the uh, the gravity from the sun and the earth are balanced. Uh, this L2 point is located almost 1 million miles from earth, well beyond the moon's orbit of 240,000 miles. And uh, one way to think of this, a very lyrical image, is that it's gonna be a million miles above midnight, wherever you are on the earth, just look up and that's a million miles straight out is where this uh, observatory is going to be parked. So uh, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope will establish a halo orbit around L2. This is so the telescope will never end up in the shadow of either the moon or the earth, and which would cut off the power to the solar panels. Yet at the same time, it will always be visible from Earth for communication purposes. And Greg mentioned this, uh, that occasionally, as the, because everything in is, a, is in a plane here, the moon will occasionally be, uh, would, if we were right at L2, like dead center, the moon would occasionally block off the, uh, the view of Earth, the path of the signal to Earth. So instead, the observatory orbits around the L2 point and if you were on the inboard side of the Earth's orbit looking in that direction, you would always be able to see the observatory circling around the Earth and also circling around the moon so that it will never get blocked. The signal will never be blocked. During the 29 day trip, the space telescope will undergo 52 major deployments, including some 300 plus single point failure procedural steps. These must not, the must not fail nature of these 300 steps added considerably to the program's cost and schedule delays. So, yeah, so uh, here is a, uh, a good view of the mirror, uh, the, primary, uh, the primary mirror. Uh, so we must fit that mirror with, that has seven times the area of the Hubble telescope into a payload shroud that is 56 feet tall and 18 feet in diameter. From one point of the hex to another point of the hex diagonally across it 
is unfortunately 21 feet. And that's why they have to fold it up. It employs a segmented foldable mirror and the entire satellite is folded up like origami. Very complex. It uses a five layer sun shield that unfolds to the size of a tennis court. And uh, the folks at NASA and Northrop Grumman had to create 10 new technologies totally from scratch. And the original cost estimate back in 1996 was $580 million. It has uh, gone up somewhat to $9.6 billion as of like two weeks ago. And so this is a, a comparison uh, between the uh, Webb Space Telescope primary mirror and the uh, Hubble primary mirror, and then a person. Uh, interestingly, the uh, Webb primary mirror, mirror weighs less than the Hubble primary, primary mirror. That's because the Hubble mirror is made out of glass and the Webb telescope mirror, mirror is made out of beryllium metal, which is much, much lighter. And it's composed of these 18 segments, hexagonal shaped segments that we see here. And then the three, the column of three on the extreme left and the extreme right are the uh, columns that fold, the mirror folds and then unfolds when it go, uh, as it is deployed. So uh, primary mirror facts, uh, the Webb telescope is 400 times more sensitive than ground-based telescopes. It is 100 times more sensitive than the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is by virtue of the fact of having a 20, 21 foot diameter as opposed to an eight foot diameter. And glass, the glass mirror like Hubble was too heavy. So 18 hexagonal mirror segments made of beryllium were used. And beryllium is a lightweight, very strong metal that is good at cryogenic temperatures. And uh, cryogenic temperatures are, uh, was, can be roughly defined as a temperature at which most of the gases that we know of, that we normally think of as being gases like oxygen, nitrogen, argon, carbon dioxide, everything that we breathe, it, they, these, these elements become liquid at these temperatures. And so at those temperatures, normal metals like steel become very brittle. And so this space telescope is gonna be even way chillier than that. The, the cryogenics is somewhere around minus 200, minus 250 degrees. You enter that realm when, when you're down that cold. This is gonna be another 100, 150 degrees colder than that out there in space. So again, have to use special materials and beryllium is one that works quite well. The segments, uh, let's see here, each uh, four, 4.3 foot diameter segment weighs about 46 pounds by itself. And with all the actuators and that get stuck on the back, uh, it ends up going up to about 88 pounds. The segments are coated in gold, uh, which reflects infrared light better. And uh, to act like one mirror, the segments must be aligned to one ten thousandth the thickness of a human hair, which is 32 nanometers. And that alignment has to be maintained during operations as the telescope is moving around so uh, this was one of, the, one of the 10 new technologies that had to be developed. And I, I would like to point out, oh yes, so there are a couple of challenges to maintaining all these components that closely is that, well, we put it on board a rocket that gets launched from the ground. There's tremendous forces, tremendous G forces of acceleration. Plus there's tremendous forces of vibration during the launch. And we're talking about precision instrumentation and it's gotta be able to withstand that to within um, the one ten thousandth the thickness of a human hair and, uh, and maintain it. And then once we get up to space and deploy uh, all those various sun shields and things, 
The hot side of the telescope is at plus 200 degrees Fahrenheit, and the cold side, side is in the neighborhood of minus 360, minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And there's only a difference of like two meters, six feet or so. Uh, and so there are tremendous differential uh, temperature differentials going from one side of the scope to the other side. And this all has to be dealt with with the, uh, the structure of the telescope. Yes, ma'am. I would think so, because this is a, uh, a I want to say, a science telescope instrument that's going to be used by the public. I would think that if it's a new technology, that I'm sure there were a dozen patents generated for each one of these, these new technologies. And yeah, I'm sure it's a matter of public record somewhere. And I would be indeed interested myself in looking into exactly how they do that. But I envision, envision that there's a lot of very tiny little motors with very tiny little screws involved that rotate very, very slowly and precisely in order to get things moving just right. And there are some other ones that are probably done using electromagnetics. And beyond that, yeah. It'd be a guess, but I'm sure the technology would be very, very interesting indeed. And it should be. Yes, that is correct. Plus, there's a thought. Here, here's another one. So, so you have a, a a couple components, and one of them is made out of material A, and the other components are made out of material B, and some more are made out of material C. And they all have different, yeah, coefficients of temperature expansion and contraction. And yet they all have to go through the same temperature drop down to minus 400 degrees and still work, even though some of them have shrunk more than the others. That is indeed a great challenge. Oh, yeah, yeah. Makes me start cringing thinking of it. Yes, sir. There must be some of this alignment while they're out there in space. Because well, that is. Unfolds, I mean, you're, you're right. I'm. I'm going to. Yeah, I'm going to get to that in in a moment. You're exactly correct. So, wait a minute. Primary mirror. Hmm. Okay, so. Uh, wave front sensing and control. So we need to focus each of the 18 segments to within 30 to 50 nanometers. And remember, that's one ten thousandth of a human hair. So what they're going to do is they're going to focus on a test star, and then they're going to wiggle each segment one by one to identify which of the 18 spots are, are showing, which are showing up on their screen which one is related to that mirror segment. So then they're going to say, aha, that's number one. And then they're going to figure out how to change the position and the tilt and the curvature of that mirror to bring that spot, which is say over here, over to the ideal location. And uh, there are, uh, they can change the, they can change the, forward and back tilt of each segment. They can change the segment left, right rotation. Plus they can change the curvature, either flatten it out or bend it more. So they can do all of these things to each of the 18 segments in order to bring each one of those spots down to the ideal location. And so they'll do that. And then they'll say, oh, next. And then they go through that, they'll repeat that 18 times. Then, so what's happening is the telescope is moving outward over a 29 day period, outward to L2. Uh, they will have deployed the sun shield at, at that point. And the cold side of the, of the observatory will be slowly cooling down and the, 
so they're going to the scientists are not going to wait until it chills down to the final temperature they're going to start the alignment process like within i believe 10 days after 10 days into that 29 day trip and so they're going to cycle through all 18 segments and that's going to that iteration will be called the course alignment uh, cycle and it'll take them a while to figure out exactly how to twitch and twist and move each segment in order to drag the the uh, uh, incorrect location light spot down to the ideal focus point so then they're going to do three iterations of course a medium and fine focus and this is one of the things this is one reason why it's going to take so long about six months for the telescope to come online because throughout that period so by the time they get to day 20 it means that the half of the points half of the mirrors on the court that they did on the course iteration cycle are now will have drifted off in some direction or another again away from the the focus and so they'll have to bring them back together again because the satellite is going to continue to chill down or rather this telescope is going to continue to chill down through this entire period and part of the structure will want to go south and part will want to go north and one part will want to go left and so it's just going to be a a constant challenge and effort until everything thermally stabilizes but they can't wait they're not going to wait for that they're going to get practice in doing focusing and figuring out better and better better and faster ways to get those everything back into focus so uh, this technology was in fact spun off you keep in mind that we're talking about 2007 this technology was spun off into a technique to diagnose eye conditions, map eye movements, and improve LASIK procedures. So if any of your friends uh, grouse at you about how the space program doesn't do anything to help uh, regular people, you can say, no, no, no. In fact, the, the James Webb Space Telescope has helped to improve LASIK procedures, and lots of people have had LASIK. So, one benefit, a spin-off spin benefit from the space program. And their response would be, I see. <laughs> yeah, I see, yes. <laughs> so uh, here is the sun shield. And you can see all the people gathered down here along the edge. Um, the, uh, it is, it, to, in order to observe infrared or heat wavelengths, the telescope must be kept very cold in this minus 360 degree minus 400 degree fahrenheit range and for the same reason that as we explained a little bit earlier there's all this random noise things things that are warm have the the uh, atoms bouncing around inside them and that's it basically gives off heat and so in order to for um the web telescope to view the objects of interest that it wants to look at it wants it has two jobs the first job is to look at light that is very old it is somewhere around 14 billion years old and even though the galaxies that are that old have plenty of suns that are still you know in the visible light range you know violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, the, the normal spectrum that we normally see. By the time the light travels to us in space, it gets stretched out. Because of the stretching of space, all the light gets red shift tor shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. And the farther away these galaxies are, the farther the shift is. And so it puts it into the mid, what's called the mid infrared range. And so that's what the, the uh, web telescope is designed to look at. That's why it's an infrared telescope. And then the second group of targets that they're going to look at is there's other forms of light. There are objects that are much, much closer to Earth, which we're interested in, but their light may be blocked by clouds of dust, stellar dust and whatnot. And the infrared can be you can view infrared, the infrared travels through these clouds, whereas visible light does not. So the Webb telescope is actually also gonna be used to look at 
uh, things like exoplanets and exoplanet atmospheres. So this is two of the two of the many, many objectives that the Webb telescope is going to do. And this is why it's an infrared telescope. And so, and why it has to be very, very cold. Go ahead. What's, what's the question? How does it, um, could you see, it tries to detect the light and then if it's where it's where it's that's the right. So for exoplanet atmospheres, how does it, like what's the work flow it goes to, I guess? Well, well, there are um, the uh, the way that like transiting uh, the way scientists examine a transiting planet is they look at the star that the planet is orbiting around and they get the spectrum of the star. And then as the planet passes in front of the star, it blocks out part of the light from the sun. So they just use a photometer to figure out, oh, well, it dipped by one and a half percent. And so they can tell then how big the planet is. And then they, they count how many days it takes for it to come around again. And so that gives them the orbital period. And from that, they can figure out the mass. But now then they got excited and said, well, you know, there's something else that happens. When if you use a spectrograph instead of a photometer, the spectrograph gives you the lines, the elemental composition of the sun. And then as the planet blocks off some of that light, if you look, you'll see now through your spectrometer, you'll see a bunch of other lines. And then when the planet moves away, those extra lines disappear again. So where are those lines coming from? Nice. So those are the lines of the elemental. In the yes, in the atmosphere, because the planets are usually not, they're not, they're not hot and radiating per se, not like a sun, but they are radiating enough in like yes, those bands that we can say, oh look, there's oxygen. Oh look, there's nitrogen. Oh look, carbon dioxide. So and and they're gonna look at those extra lines, and that will tell them if it's a planet where it's got mostly a methane atmosphere which will be of some interest, but not so much. But if it's got a lot of oxygen in it, then that's going to suddenly go right to the head of the list as being a very interesting candidate for further study. So that's, that's what that's about. Any other questions at this point? OK. So the, uh, so the Webb Space Telescope uh, must be shielded from, from the sun, the Earth, and the moon, uh, not just the light from them which would swamp out the signals on the detectors, but also the heat from those plants. Believe it or not, even at that distance, there's going to be enough heat being thrown off, and reflected heat coming from the, from the Earth and from the moon, that it would cause problems with the science instruments. So um, that's why the sun shield is there. And then also the um, that light impacting on the part of the, the telescope structure would heat up the structure. And so they've figured out a clever way to isolate, keep certain electronics on the hot side of the sun shield, and then the optics and those very cold instruments on the other side of the sun shield. And you keep it separate, and that way the heat does not conduct through. And so that's what the sun shield is about. And uh, so the telescope uses a five layer kite shaped sun shield the size of a tennis court to partition the scope into a hot side at plus 200 Fahrenheit and a cold side at minus 400 Fahrenheit. The mirror and the cameras are on the cold side. The spacecraft power communications and engines are on the hot side. Each layer is less than half the thickness of a sheet of paper, 0.002,000. 0 0.002 inches divided by two. So it's like one thousandth of an inch or less made of Kapton, a commercially available plastic polyamide film. 
that will be coated with aluminum. The, uh, each layer of the sun shield is cooler than the one below and heat radiates out from between the layers with the vacuum between the layers providing the insulation. And as you can see, the layers are gonna be spaced apart. They're gonna be pulled apart one by one and they're gonna end up about, it looks like about a foot apart. And so the heat, each layer will stop heat from the, the some lead, heat is going to leak through each one of those screens, but it's gonna be less and less at each stage and it's gonna transmit sort of, or, well, it's gonna radiate. And then the gap is where the heat will radiate out sideways. That's gonna be the preferred path for the heat to travel out sideways instead of traveling through to the next layer. Uh, let's see here. So uh, the sun shield is a passive system with no consumables for cooling. A lot of uh, previous uh, spacecraft and observatories have used, um, helium gas and other gas type cooling to try and keep the electronics chilled you know, over large areas and volumes. And after a while that coolant runs out and that has that tends to limit the lifetime of the satellite or of the of the scientific instrument. Because this is going to be uh, passive cooling, it means that it doesn't run out. It's not gonna run out of coolant. So this helps improve the lifetime of the instrument. Um, the membranes are folded 12 times in order to fit in the payload shroud of the Ariane 5 rocket. Now this may not seem to be like a very big thing, but if you take a piece of paper and fold it in half, I think there are not very many people who could get beyond six folds, to be honest. And even with origami paper, I think you can only go two or three more folds beyond that. So this really is a very impressive uh, number of folds in order to get this sunshield uh, origami uh, folded up into its launch position. Uh, the sunshield support structure contains more than 7,000 parts, including springs, bearings, pulleys, and magnets and hundreds of custom fabricated parts. Uh, as an engineer, I can tell you that the more parts there are in a system, uh, the more likelihood there is of something failing. And the more moving parts there are, the more likelihood there is of something failing. Uh, from personal experience, I can tell you it's always going to be the thing that you figure, oh, I don't have to worry about that because, oh, that's just, you know, that, that works all the time that's going to be the one that comes back and bites you. So, I mean, with 7,000 parts, the actions and interactions between the components is just frighteningly large. They can't poss couldn't possibly have tested all of the ways it could go wrong. So keep your fingers crossed, people. Unfurling the sun shield is among uh, some of the 40 major deployments. Uh, so what we have here is the uh, back plane, the mounting structure that uh, the uh, segments are mounted on. And if you look carefully, you can actually see the people right here, two of them, to get a sense of the scale of the, of the uh, back plane. It's made of a lightweight composite structure, which is very, very stiff, and it weighs only two and a half tons. Uh, it must remain motionless so that the mirrors and science instruments can operate as intended. And it must be, again, steady down to one ten thousandth of a human hair during repeated temperature swings from minus 350 Fahrenheit down to minus 410 Fahrenheit on the cold side. And it holds up the primary mirror and all the other optics plus all the science instruments. Um, okay, regarding the science instruments now, uh, there's a, uh, the near-infrared and mid-infrared detectors and the uh, cryogenic data acquisition integrated circuit. Uh, for those of you who are really interested in uh, geek details, uh, detecting faint emissions from distant galaxies, stars, and planets requires large arrays for efficient sky surveys, a special multi-year technology development effort 
For the Webb Space Telescope, yielded arrays that are larger format and much more sensitive than anything previously developed. The near-infrared detector that you see here in the photo is a four megapixel, that's four million pixels, a mercury cadmium telluride chip for wavelengths of uh, 0 0.6 to 5 microns, which is the visible orange part of the spectrum and red uh, through the near infrared spectrum. Then there's another detector, the mid infrared detector, and it is a one megapixel silicon arsenic chip for wavelengths. It picks up at five microns and goes to 29 microns. So uh, again, these were specially developed chips. They had to work. I mean, you may remember, or you may be aware if, if you read the owner's manual when you bought your new cell phone, um, they probably said somewhere in the instructions, don't try to use your phone at you know 10 degrees Fahrenheit, any, any temperature colder than whatever. What, anybody want to chip in? Did, did anybody read the small print on their last phone? No. Yeah, I mean, but they tell you, don't, use, don't you even try to use your phone in the cold, in the very, very cold or very, very hot. And very, very cold is very definitely where exactly where these chips have to work their best. And uh, so, uh, yeah, each one of these chips is about the size of a postage stamp. And so it's got 4 million, 4 million pixels in a postage stamp. That's, that's really little tiny pixels. So the uh, web space, telescope team developed a new technology uh, for low noise cryogenic application specific uh, integrated circuit microprocessor with extremely low power dissipation and a 16-bit analog to digital converter that generates less noise compared to conventional warm electronics. So I thought some of you like you might be able able to appreciate that that information i mean again it's got to be able to do uh, uh, an operation that normally generates a lot of heat and it's absolutely critical and they've come up with a way to do it and it generates very very little heat um so yes then the uh the uh, next instrument that's on the back is the uh, mid infrared instrument cryo cooler. Uh, the web is outfitted with four science instruments. The near infrared spectrograph, wait a second, yeah. The near infrared spectrograph, uh, which can uh, determine temperature, mass, and chemical composition of 200 targets simultaneously. The near IR camera, near infrared camera, designed to image the most distant objects in near infrared light, the near infrared imager and slitless spectrograph, and then the mid infrared instrument to observe cold distant objects and provide spectroscopy mapping. This is the last one. This is MIRI, M-I-R-I, the mid infrared detector. It has its own cooler to reduce its operating temperatures an additional 50 to 60 degrees colder than what the rest of the, the uh, front side of the uh, observatory is at. It, that is just above absolute zero. Manufacturing and development problems with this device caused major program delays. Uh, the cryo cooler compressor is assembly pictured is a heat pump consisting of a pre-cooler that generates one quarter of a watt of cooling power at 14 K minus 434 degrees Fahrenheit using helium gas as a working fluid and a high efficiency pump that circulates refrigerant, also helium gas, cooled by conduction with the pre-cooler to the MIRI instruments, the MIRI, the chip. The only moving parts in the cryo cooler are a pair of two cylinder piston pumps in the cryo cooler assembly that are horizontally opposed, which cancels out most vibration. As a closed system, the cryo cooler does not use liquid helium or any other coolant. 
Its operational life is limited only by wear to its moving parts and pump pistons and the longevity of its electronics. Okay, another new technology, major technology effort focused on the micro shutters. They are tiny windows, the width of a few hairs that allow scientists to block out unwanted light so only the most distant stars and galaxies can be detected by NERSPEC, the Near Infrared Spectrometer. So what we see here is a, is a picture of each one of these, these little uh, uh, shutters and they're, let's see here, they are, the micro shutter assembly consists of tiny cells measuring 100 by 200 microns, about the width of three human hairs by six human hairs. And you see the little tiny hinge there that holds the micro shutters that opens and closes. And this is a beam of light coming in, they're showing. The uh, beginning at technology readiness level zero, work on the micro shutters stalled for a decade due to acoustic damage issues. Uh, technology readiness, readiness level uh, increments are a, a, something that NASA and the government uses that has since migrated into industry that breaks down the steps of developing an idea from just something that's scribbled on the back of a napkin to the various stages of testing components, testing sub-assemblies, testing assemblies in the lab, all is in the lab, and then testing it in con actually conditions, and then giving it to a customer to beta test it, and then technology level six is where you actually can sell it. It's out in the real world and it's working. So they had to go from zero to six. Uh, most things, most things in order to, most projects, you really don't want something that isn't already at like TR level three, like someone has already got it sort of working in the lab. By starting at zero, it, it was like, oh, this is really hard. And that's what caused the, some of the delays in the project. They, they really did underestimate the difficulty of some of the tasks that they set themselves to do. So uh, the, uh, each grid, Yes, the micro shutter, micro shutter assembly consists of tiny cells, three to six size of three to six human hairs arranged in four waffle-like grids. Each grid, the size of a postage stamp, contains more than 62,000 shutters designed to be individually opened or closed to view or block a portion of the sky. This is your job for today. Figure out which windows we have to open or close for the, today's observations. All 62,000 of them. Okay. With micro shutters, NERSPEC will become the first spectroscope that can make high resolution observations of 100 objects simultaneously. Operating in extreme cold, the micro shutters made of silicon nitride. When you see silicon, think ceramics. So it's operating at minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, a ceramic that had to demonstrate reliable operation without fatigue. Now, fatigue, if you look at that little hinge here, that's like that little piece of metal when you're taking the lid off of the top of a can. And there's always that one last little piece that the can opener didn't cut. And so you gotta reach over there and fiddle with the lid and then start going and eh, 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 bending it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until it gets brittle enough to snap off. And then you can take the contents out of the can. Well, this is very, very similar to that, only they don't want it to break. And so six years of design effort led to these tiny shutters that could open and close 200,000 plus cycles, which is double their design life. And so, you know, that concludes the uh, uh, explanation of the various instruments on the, the Webb telescope. Then the uh, telescope was loaded with propellants on December 3rd, which was about a week ago, uh, 80 liters of hydrazine and 160 liters of nitrogen tetroxide for station keeping. As noted before, it's gonna be in orbit 
uh, a halo orbit around the L2 point, and that orbit is going to require periodic station keeping. They're going to have to use the little engines periodically to burn off a little fuel to, it, it will, left to its own devices, the, the telescope will start drifting farther and farther away from the L2 point. So they have to periodically nudge it, push it back towards the center of the L2 region in order to keep it or in that nice orbit. And so uh, the design life, the station keeping propellant uh, will give it a design life of five years. And uh, they're, hopefully, they're hopeful that they can stretch that out to 10 years by carefully marshalling the use of the fuel. Yes. <laughs> Why would it drift away? The L2 point, the, all of the Lagrange points are locations where, uh, I don't know if you've seen the, the presentation of a gravity well, it's like the rubber sheet where they have a big weight that represents the sun. And then over here, there's a, a second smaller weight that represents the earth. And it, it makes that dent in the rubber sheet. Okay, well, what happens is, depending on the masses, the, the, so the rubber sheet is actually sloped, right? So what happens is when there's no masses there, space is flat, right? That's okay. But the gravity wells, when they come together, they form a, something like this. Visualize a saddle. Look at that from this point. This is the sun over here, and this is the earth over here. There's a saddle point that if, if the satellite starts to drift this way, it will start going downhill faster and faster towards the sun. If it gets a little bit of a start headed this way outward, it will head faster and faster downhill towards the earth. But the saddle, it's also a saddle, so it has curvature this way. So it means that if it was to go forward in orbit or backwards from the earth's orbit, it would, it would be perturbed, but then it would tend to roll back towards the low spot here. So in this direction, it's stable, but in the inward and outward direction, it's unstable. So it has to do with the curvature of, of, the, of the space because of gravity, the gravity wells. Now that, what I just described is, where's this? Back, 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 back. What I just described is what happens like at the L1 point, that curvature of space. Well, similarly, it's, it's very similar to that at the L2 point, um, except that the curvature from the sun, well, the curvature from the sun is about the same as it is at the L1 point because the distance from L1 to L2, you know, the sun is way over there. And so that's not much of a difference, but uh, it's a little bit flatter there at L2. And in fact, there are already four, there are four or five satellites already out there. WMAP, the Wilkinson Mapping Astrometrical uh, Instrument. And then there's something called GAIA, the, which I have heard about, which has been up there for five years, doing extremely accurate astrometric uh, uh, observations. We are finally mapping the stars so that we know which direction they are and exactly how far they are. Before we had to guess, and sometimes the guesses were off by, oh, you know, plus or minus 100 light years or so. Now, we're, Gaia is getting things mapped out very, very accurately, the distance. So, and then there's like three others, and they're all doing, some of them are doing infrared and x-ray and all that. But uh, L3 is sort of like L1, L2. But L4 and L5, they are different because they, because of where they are, the, the influence of Earth is, is kind of less, but it means that space is flatter out in their region. So you can visualize it as being more like a bowl, a very shallow bowl in all directions, inward, outward, forward, and reverse. So if you put something at L4, if it starts moving away from the exact center, it's basically moving uphill in all directions. 
And so it tends to roll back towards the center of the zone for both L4 and L5. Now, that explanation isn't 100% accurate because it isn't quite, the curvature isn't quite, it isn't quite flat. There is some curvature in the inward and outward directions, but that is compensated for by something called the Coriolis force. And the Coriolis force acts at 90 degrees, 90 degrees to the direction of motion, which has in this instance, the desirable property of counteracting perturbations in the inward and outward direction. The satellite might start to drift out, but then the Coriolis force tends to nudge it back towards the center of the L4 or the L5 zone. So things that go to L4, L5, they tend to stay there for a very, very long time. That's so those, you can visualize those space at those points as being sort of like a very shallow bowl that tends to keep things there in the bowl. L1, L2, and L3 are not, they're, they're saddle, they're metal stable points. They're only partially stable. Does that answer the question? No, go ahead. That's okay. That, that's why we're here. Ask away. Yeah, we spent about 25 minutes Yeah, there's some good ones out there. Yeah, there, there is a good one out there. Um, yeah. Yeah, we'll. One more question. Sure. Not related to this. Um, Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, the full layer, uh, the five layer uh, sun shield. The picture you showed us, is that folded or is it? This is this is the folded uh, version. Is there a way that you can quick with a hotspot here come up bring up that deployment video? Uh, like the uh, twenty nine days. Of yeah, the twenty nine. That was it. Yeah, we wanted to show that first. I totally forgot that the twenty nine uh, days. Well, the thing is, I don't think we have enough uh, projection our time. To kind oh. of, but we could send it out. Maybe. Okay. Okay. Well, if you go to the uh, the uh, James Webb Space Telescope site, uh, the NASA site, they've got a um, they've got a website just for the telescope, and um, there's a uh, there's a series of buttons along the top of the screen, and the one at the extreme uh, right uh, says deployment or deployment sequence or something. And if you press on that, it's got like all 50 of the main deployment sequences shown there step by step, and then also animations of that individual step. So it takes you from the beginning to the end of that deployment. And it, it is real neat to see the, to see the uh, space telescope, the components, uh, you know, it's like I said, it's like origami, it's all packed up. And then the front swings down, the back swings down, and then these two booms, come out sideways like a like the masts on a ship and then there's cables and things and they start pulling apart things start splitting apart and then the sun shield spreads apart on one side and then the other side comes out and then they're it's stuck tight the layers because they're only you know uh ten thousandths of an inch thick when they're packed and then one by one they kind of pop up away from each other, about a foot, space out about a foot apart from each other. And then the whole thing kind of like tightens up. It goes from being sort of saggy and loose to real tight. And it's, it's very impressive. And then they also do other things with, they have a, there's a, there's a tail on the end of the, of the observatory that pops out that helps station keeping of the satellite because otherwise the pressure from the sun would make it unstable so they've got this little tail back there that you can't see in this shot that they use and then they show unpacking some of the other instruments the radiators the solar panels the high gain antennas that send signals back to earth it's kind of cool and, and also the primary optic uh display unfolding okay Questions? Oh, yes. That was the. Oh, wow. 
Let's see here. There. Do, are there any other questions? Three hundred, three hundred single point failure steps in this, in this spacecraft in order for it to work. Single point failure means no backups. I mean, NASA normally, with with any of their manned spacecraft, certainly they use the triple backup system. There was the primary system, backup number one, and backup number two, in case. And there were a few occasions where they had to use backup system number two, because the first, not just the first system failed, but the second one failed too. So I'm sure there's lots of astronauts who are happy that they used the triple backup method. And most other uh, systems on most other craft have a, there's a primary system and a backup system, but not this one. They just, they just couldn't do it. Apparently it was, they added too much weight, too much complexity to an already complex uh, piece of equipment. And so from what I understand, this is again, one of the things that added tremendously to the cost overruns in the schedule was that they had these parts, these 7,000 parts, like just for the sun shield alone, and they tested them and tested them and tested them just to death, literally, in order to make sure these things would work first time, every time. And they're, that this, this is their story and they're sticking to it. And no, they can't do, they can't, it's going to be so far out, a million miles out, they can't send astronauts out or anybody out to go service it. Although there is a, there's going to be where it attaches to the Ariane shroud structure, there is in theory a place where another vehicle, space vehicle could, could cruise on up to it and grab onto it, but none of the hardware components were designed to be taken apart by a robot or by a human. And once it's put together, and that's it. So, well, thank you very much. Uh, let's go around for a Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to do the elections via email just to save time. Uh, we'll be uh, getting over here for a good picture. And uh, since that gets a call reassembling the room, uh, we had uh, three tables up here and two sets of three tables there. So, I'll wait, we can do that after a good picture. Okay. Thank you so much, Doug. All right. I think I'll go ahead and just stop the recording. And I'll go ask them if they could take a picture. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> You know, it's it's more yeah. 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 this for a moment, Stuart. Okay. Well, 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 well,